Let's start today. Let's see how far we can Okay, so yesterday I announced that I will uh, keep you post dinner three. Looks like it's not uh, going to happen because I didn't realize that uh, there was no discussion uh, break scheduled for today. So uh, therefore, so we added a discussion session today. So that will eat up our time from the post session. So there was originally uh, about three hours I think was planned for post session. So that will cut down. So we will have a discussion. I just need to. Uh, <laughs> 
And uh, I'm not going to talk about the other things that my lab does, which are related to the generation, and we'll talk about it a little bit in the last uh, school. 
So, by now you all are familiar with this picture, um, which is that a neuron is composed of a cell body and it has a really long axon. And uh, most of the protein synthesis in the neurons occurs inside the cell bodies, and the axons and synapses are only capable of very limited protein synthesis. So, all proteins have to be made in the cell body and transported into the axons throughout the life of the axon. So, I'd like to start my talk with uh, some of the classical studies that have been done on axonal transport because I think that um, those were the studies that actually defined the whole transport phenomenon. And whatever we find, I think, has to relate back to these studies. So, in these studies, what people did was they injected radio labeled amino acids in the vicinity of, uh, of um, animals. Uh, in the spinal cord of the neurons. And these amino acids got incorporated into nucleus and precise proteins in the cell bodies. And then what people did was they, they cut the axon at various, uh, at various times after injection, and all they did was they just ran gels of proteins that were found in different times, and they could infer by that um, there was a movement of proteins from the cell bodies into the axons. Right. So when people did that, what they found was a serious phenomenon. And this was an experiment in the So this is just an example to show how the radial radio label changed over time. So out here is the cell body and this is distance from the axon. These are three different um, uh, so, so it's the same axon, it's like different axons, but at three different time points, four, six, nine. And you can see that there's this wave that comes out of the axon. And if you look later on, this wave becomes more, um, there's a peak here. And then after nine days, the peak kind of advances. So basically, there's been axonal transport of these peaks of proteins from here to there over a period of two days. Okay. Okay, so what people found was this curious phenomenon, which is after very little, there was this rapid movement of a group of proteins, and which was called fast axonal transport. They just moved rapidly down the axon. And then kind of nothing happened for a couple of days. And then slowly there was a movement of another component that came in, which was called slow axonal transport. And when people analyzed the, these two groups further, they found that the fast axonal transport was composed of uh, mainly vesicles and mitochondria that moved at about 100 to 400 millimeters per day. And the slow component was composed of cytoskeletal proteins, neurofilaments and microtubules, and about 200 other proteins which were basically soluble or cytosolic proteins. And there would be things like um, uh, like uh, gap pH and platinum, and basically any protein that doesn't have a transmembrane domain or doesn't have a membrane anchor would be in this group. So, what happened to the case What happened in the case of what? Uh, in the case of what? So, that's a separate topic. Let's talk about that. No, no. So, um, now, when people look more closely at the slow axon transport, they found that there were really two different groups, which they call slow component A or SCA, and slow component B or SCB. So, the slow component A was relatively simple, composed of basically you know, filaments and microtubules, and you know, a lot about this. Um, and the slow component B was made of these cytosolic proteins. Now, note that these, these uh, differences are huge, so they are not, not really and a small difference, it just have a lot of semantic uh, difference um, between the past and the So, the other interesting phenomenon that has been overlooked uh, in the literature has been that, uh, and I, I will come back to it later in the talk, which is when they carefully looked at the slow component B, which was the solid components, they found that most of the time, or almost all the time, there was this little um, fraction, about 10 to 15 percent of proteins in slow component B, were also passed in, uh, found in, passed in the past one. And there's a significance, I think, to this, which I hope will be clear right here at the top, but has, has largely been ignored. 
All right, so after this, uh, people started just uh, looking at axons and asking how proteins are, uh, vesicular proteins are being transported. And uh, Scott showed you some movies from the squid axon that you saw a plethora of vesicles moving. And these are just uh, things that we do all the time, just like carrying with synaptophysin and the sloan, which are vesicle markers. Cell bodies here, the axons here. So you can see there's a tremendous amount of movement that's going on in the axon at all times. This is seconds. So it's seconds and milliseconds. Um, and it became quite clear that the fast component that they were seeing in the radiolating experiments was essentially this tremendous movement of vesicles that they So that's a right. stretch. So I got into the story uh, when I was a uh, much younger, Dr. Roy, as you can see. And I was with Mark Black, who was my thesis advisor. And he was interested in uh, slow axon transport. And before that time, the problem had been that the slow axon transport had never been visualized. So they hadn't been actually seen. So when people looked at the movements of motors and all these things which have been established, you know, all the motors moved at very really fast rates. Right? So it was really not clear how the fast motors could generate this really slow movement that was going on in the axon. And, you know, it may be folklore or not, but there's, there's actually numerous hypotheses that have been proposed. For example, some said there would be a slow motor, some said there would be, you know, some kind of a weird phenomenon that just moves these slow proteins along the axons. And, and it's noteworthy that before um, our studies were published, all of those hypotheses were gone. And I'll tell you what the, uh, what the real phenomenon was. So anyway, so uh, when I went to the lab, Mark showed me these, these neurons, which are cultured sympathetic neurons. And this is just a cultured sympathetic neuron with each chain of neurons. And neurofilaments, as you know, are not essential for the survival of the cell. And it just so happens that if you have really thin axons, they just don't have any neurofilaments in them. So if you look at the neurofilament array in these axons, you can see that you can easily find 10 axons where there are gaps in the neurofilament array. Okay. And um, the idea we had was that if we could somehow label all the neurofilaments in the axons, okay, and then look into the gap, then we could have a chance of actually seeing the thing that is actually moving through the gap. Okay. It's a pretty simple experiment. Um, so that's what we did, and I, I toiled on this project for two years, and my, my thinking at that time was that we have to see some sort of a really slow movement of proteins that was going on in the action, right? So I kept looking on the gaps, so I figured I figured a way to label them, you know, this was back in 2000, 2001 or something like that. So I mean, GFP, etc. were not as widely used. So, um, anyway, I figured all those things out, and I kept looking at them, and I, and I used the time interval of minutes for expecting the slow variety this in my mind. And every time I did the experiment, I, I noticed that there was some movement going on, but it was completely different from time to time. So I kept shortening my time interval to kind of see what's going on, and this is what we saw. So this is the gap, right? And these are neurofilaments that are labeled on the other side of the gap. It's just another axon. Um, and as I start the movie, you'll see that this neurofilament and this gap will move anteriorly. And uh, there will be time in seconds if you're in some way. So you can see this is uh, time in seconds. And the surprise was that the movement was quite fast. So, um, you were pretty surprised at this at this time, at, at that time. And, but when we looked further on, and I guess all of you know the story by now, but when we looked, we saw that uh, even though the neurofilaments moved fast, there were these large gaps, there's a large pauses in the movement of individual filaments. So this filament, for example, moves fast, pauses for several minutes, and then takes off again. Um, and this work really, uh, so I kind of moved on from there and did my residency on it and stuff, and it took me like six years to get back to science. Um, and uh, Tony Brown's lab really kind of has took this concept and really um, done amazing work over the years. And essentially, that it's established now that pretty much in a lot of different systems, when you look at neurofilament transport and also like transport, as we showed you, you have this rapid movement followed by 
a long period of pause, it's still, and an average given is 10-20% of the time it's moving. Um, and this is now known as the stop and go hypothesis. And the, the idea is that the overall movement of the population is slow because you have things that are moving rapidly. So using the same orders, there's no different orders, um, but they just pause for a long period of time. This is kind of yeah, interesting. Okay. So, but remember, I told you that there were two formulations of slow axon transport. The slow component A that moves the cytoskeleton and the B. And um, I would like to point out that the slow component B, at least in terms of amounts, is actually one of the largest components in axon transport, much bigger than the others. And also, it has you know, hundreds and hundreds of groups that people study all the time. So these these are just a small list. We actually don't even have a complete list because we're kind of working on that right now. But um, for example, it has proteins like SOD, GH, SSH, C70, gametinase, platinum, synapsin, synuclein. Motors know about that. You know, the dynins and the myosins are known to move in slow sometimes. And we basically know nothing about this. Now, how this movement happens, what is it, what, how is it regulated, what kind of movement it is, and that's what I'm going to show you um, today, or some, some of the work that we've done to address this issue. And uh, I'd like to point out that, you know, this is not, uh, the, the slow movement is very well established by, by old studies, so there's no confusion or conflict over that. Um, we chose to study this protein called synapsin movement, uh, which is known to move in slow and fast. But part of the reason we chose it, because there is no controversy about how it moves. There's been numerous designs, different labs would see that synapse basically moves in slow as it So the question is how does the slow move? So whenever I talk with people who are not in the field, they say, oh, it must be moving in the field. And um, I just want to use an analogy here to, to show you that, you know, you can't really come to this season. So when, when you drop milk in your coffee this morning, uh, or tea, then, uh, you know, this is really the process of diffusion, somewhat. We're throwing milk and we just allow it to diffuse into the coffee. And I would like to point out that if you consider the volumes of the cell body in the axon, the situation would be like throwing the milk in the okay. So, so it's, you're not going to get your protein by diffusion, anywhere by diffusion anytime soon. So, do not come to come. Okay, so part of the reason why this field has been dormant for so many years has been just the inherent difficulty in studying cell reproduction. And I'm just demonstrating it by this example. So as, you, as I showed you, you can get reciprocal protein in the least. For example, there's an in this one. And you have a lot of movement in axons. You, have, you, can, draw, you can generate very nice time of action. You can, uh, look at the slope of the each vesicle uh, as it moves and you can calculate the velocity and all that kind of stuff. Now this is an axon that is transfected with synapsin, which is the slope slow component solvable protein, transfected with uh, so, uh, tag with GFP. And and you can see that you know something's going on in there, right? But there's really no chance of studying this, this movement right now. So that was one of the issues. So we decided to tackle the issue by using the probability. And what we thought that instead of just throwing the protein in, and, and because it's soluble protein, it's going to fill up with the axon, how about if we just could label a small fraction of proteins in the middle of the axon, and then just look at the axon and ask how the protein moves over time? So that's what we did. And this is an example of an axon that's been transfected with a soluble red marker, just so you can see the axon and a photoactivatable GFP back to synapsin. And this image is just after photoactivation, and you can see that the, the, the region between the two arrowheads is the photoactivated cell. And then we just looked at this. And this is what we saw. So we saw that this is a thermograph again, and uh, time is on the uh, y-axis, so it's 132 seconds and distance is on the x-axis. Now this region between the arrowheads here is the same region here that's been photoactivated. 
And you can see that instead of having vesicles move, you really have a situation where there is this plume of movement. You know, this soluble motion. <laughs> it looks like it's diffusion, right? Yeah. Moving but if you look closely, you see that this is the distal side and this is the proximal side. This is the tip of the axon, is here, cell body So you can see that there is this bias of movement, which if you just apply pseudo to the exact same kind of it just becomes more clearer, where there is this plume of, of soluble proteins or soluble cargo that moves with an angular rate bias. Right? Question. Question. Yes, so if you have control just for the object, can you do that? Show you, please. I'll show you. So, um, so, we did that for several other proteins, and this is just showing that the same phenomenon we see in the CAM panels. Again, we have this flow of soluble uh, protein that moves distally. And this is uh, <coughs> Jim, uh, your question, which is a question I also show you in the movie center. But if you do the exact same experiment with the soluble untapped for that particular GP, you see what you would expect to see, which is an extremely rapid bidirectional diffusion. And I'll show you more later so that this is not biased. If you do the exact same experiment with a vesicular protein that is not to move fast axon transport, in this case I'm showing it with GPP. Um, when you photoactivate this zone, you see individual vesicles being photoactivated, which you would expect. So these vesicles are highlighted by atoms. And then these vesicles move away in a stochastic manner one at a time, exactly like you would expect for a vesicular transport. Okay, so I want to show you some of the movies. So the first one is EHEFP transport, and this is time in minutes and seconds. And you can see at the end of about a minute, you have this movement of this fluorescent uh, zone, and the, there is more of an angular wave bias. It's the exact same movie that you uh, saw the panel right now. Okay, so if you do it with KPP, which is fast transport, now the region between the arrowheads is the photoactivated zone. And you can see that as soon as you photoactivate, you have <coughs> Vesicles that were probably moving before you photoactivated them, but as soon as you photoactivate them, they escape the photoactivated zone and move bidirectionally in a stochastic one at a time, which is very different from what you see with solid proteins. Right? And if you do the same experiment with untapped EHFP, this is time in seconds, it's just an extremely rapid phenomenon where as soon as you photoactivate, you see this bidirectional. Um, just diffusion of the scanning is working in both directions, right? Which is also something that you would escape. Okay, so I'd like to say that we had this classic aha moment followed by a post shift moment. Because we realized that we have this really interesting phenomenon, right? But we had no way of studying it. Because it was so easy to just look at the time we had to draw on and extract the velocity. What are you going to do here? Right? It's just this plume of molecules that is moving and somehow we quantify it. So I had this really smart guy in my life who developed all these stuff. So I'm going to show you uh, what we did with this. So the idea was that um, if you if you look at this axon, and this is the first image after photo activation, and if you draw a line scan through this region, what are you going to get? You're going to get something like this, right, where you have a peak and you have a uh, Gaussian curves. Now I'm showing the Gaussian curves just to for demonstration, but actually we use raw data for all these analysis. But you have a centroid of the photoactivated zone. Okay, now think about it. If all the molecules or, or a population of molecules within the photoactivated zone moves in one direction or the other, then what we would get is we would get the movement of the centroid in one direction or the other. Right? So just to demonstrate this phenomenon, uh, this is a, a, a movie of a photoactivated zone. This is the panograph, and this is the data from these panographs. And you can see that as the movie goes on, you have this movement of the centroid from the center of the photoactivated zone distally towards the tip as the population is flowing in the direction. It's a pretty simple thing. 
And we use this thing, we call it intensity center shift. This other thing that we have come up on. Have you pressed any buttons? This thing doesn't mean the main buttons in the middle of the bias on top of the bias. Is it symmetric? The last spend of the bias? Uh, we, so as I said, we actually don't take the Gaussian curves. I, did, I put the Gaussian curves just so it's easier to visualize. But um, but we actually take the raw data. Um, find the find the centroid of the, of the raw data. What is what about the maxes? The max is what we use. So yeah, why it whether it should remain Gaussian or not? Let's talk about that. It actually should. Okay, so now from this, we just calculate the intensity center shift versus time. And basically, this is the movement of the population, right? Because you have this population at time zero. As time goes on, you have the movement of the center. So we, we figured that this would be a nice way to calculate the, the slow and And what was really interesting was that the numbers we got from just calculating the slopes of the slow and parameters were just embarrassingly close to what people had reported for. So that's some transport in the world. So we were pretty confident that we were looking at the right thing. Now, coming to James' question, when you do the same experiment with a soluble untacked PHFP, you will again and, and calculate the intensity of the shift. You do not have a shift because you have a straight line um, suggesting that basically there's no ball flow of the entire population. Do you know this thing from the Uh, which, so you need, uh, if we look at a bigger GFP module, we see something different. Yeah, we haven't done that. We, we want to do that as well, and we just haven't done that. So we are kind of, we started making the multi-noise of GFP, but, uh, but I think we should do that. Um, anyway, so if you, if you look at other proteins and we've done a few of you pretty much get the same phenomenon where you get a shift in the intensity center, which is pretty similar to the surprise that we've got a lot of these proteins. Um, okay. um, so then we looked at the, uh, this movement to ask whether it was market TV dependent or not. And on the top, I'm showing you a kind of graph of uh, PHAP snaps, and then you can see there's a nice movement. But if you add hypothesis in this mixture, a very low amount, can't remember exactly how much, um, and you just wait 30 minutes and for the activate the same axon again, uh, you have a decrease in the movement. And you can also show by, um, we have actually also did this with the population, and basically the movement is hypothesis dependent, uh, mitochondrial dependent. And the movement is also energy dependent. So if you use a, a mitochondrial poison to put an actinol, you can block this movement as well. If you use a compound called N-ethyl myelin, which is an alkylating agent that uh, in, you use it in very low amounts, 25 micromole, and, and if you start it from before, they inject it in axons, two axons, you get a tremendous stop of, uh, like a very rapid block of tangosin, uh, binding, and myosin. So it was a quick and very way to see whether this was motor dependent or not, because obviously we have to do a lot of work to find out the motor there. And, and basically, you can see here that the addition of, of NEM to either of these slow component proteins causes a complete stasis in the movement within, within a few seconds. Okay. Um, so all this work that I'm, uh, a lot of this work that I'm going to show you have been published already. And if you want to look at the methods more closely, I would suggest that you go to this protocol paper that, that we published last year. Okay. So, Sandhya. So, um, when I first met Sandhya at a, at a Gordon conference, she told me that she was hearing from the Great Great Pine that there is no slow axon of transfer in culture neurons. So, I got really nervous, and, and all these experiments are a result of that. So, I'm going to show you a direct comparison. It's true, she told me, oh, I don't have this. So. And some big shot told her that. Um, big shot in transfer. So, um, so anyway, I really wanted to make sure that there is so much more transfer in culture neurons. I'm going to show you some, it's fun experiments, which I could directly compare to the transmission. So, um, 
So far I showed you for that additional maximums, but now I'm going to show you a slightly different paradigm where we actually put that to the So if you focus on this picture here, this is just a hippocampal neuron translated with a soluble red marker. And you can see these neurons are just beautiful, they're really nice on this. And morphologically, it's easy to identify the axon because it just looks so different from a dendrite. And you can see that this axon is coming up here and going down and branching. So what we did was we transfected this neuron with photoactivatable synapsin. And then instead of photoactivating the axon like we did before, we photoactivated the cell bulb, right? And then we just looked into the axon to see the convergence of the photoactivated protein into the axon. And we did the same experiment with synapsin, which is a slow component protein, and also APP, which is a fast component protein, and I'll show you the results of that. So when you do this experiment with synapsin, you see, I think, what you would expect to see, which is basically a flow of proteins into the axons. And this is over time. Now, this is a pseudocolor just so you can see the movement. You can see that there's this uh, a, a flow, really. I mean, you can't really tell what's going on. And you can uh, look at the parameter. It's over 500 seconds. <coughs> and you can see this protein is flowing into the axon. And then you do this exact same experiment with APP, you get a really remarkably different result. And I'll show you when I start this movie here. What you get is you have to immediately move from the cell body to the axon because you have this tremendous amount of anterior wave flame moving vesicles that just rapidly decay the axon. So basically the overall kinetics of movement is completely different in strong plastics. So you can see what they're different, but you know, are they really um, moving at different rates, overall different rates? So you see that we used a, a, a slightly different pattern where we transfected GFP synapsin or GFP synaptophysin in the axons, in neurons. And then remember these neurons have long axons and they form presynaptic glutons along the line. So we said that since both of these were synaptic phases, what we would do is we would do just very long term time lapse and just look at the synapse. We would transfer the protein in the cell body and allow the protein to get expressed just for four to six hours so that they start to start getting expressed. And then we would just go to the synapse and wait at the synapse for this protein to appear at the synapse. And the expectation, if, if there is flow at some point in this neuron, then you would expect that the synaptophysin would appear much more faster at the synapse than the synapsin would, right? It's just a race. So we had a race between slow and fast axon transfer. And this is just to show you how the experiment works. You transfer GFP synapsin, wait for three to four hours for the protein to start assembling. And then you see the initial entry of the fluorescent proteins into the synapses over time. And this is just the um, images to show you that the data, data is actually really high quality and clear. So this is hours and hours, the way it is slow with that message. Let's just see the change. And then we wrote some algorithms to still uh, precisely calculate the distance of each of these protons from the somatoaxonal junction so that we could say how far each proton was from the center. And we just uh, asked how rapidly the protein is compared in these two lines. And if you focus on this, so we divided the, our data into four coordinates just so that we could just present it. And uh, this is just based on distance. So this quarter four is about 150 to 200 microns. And each of these quarters is uh, 50 microns, 50 to 100, 100 to 150, and 150 to 200. And if you focus on, on this graph here, this just looks at the rate of accumulation of fluorescence in glutons that are within 50 microns. Okay. And the black triangles are synaptophysin accumulation and the open circles are synapsin accumulation. You can see that for each quarter that we looked at, the accumulation of synaptophysin, which was much faster or, or much uh, faster than synapsin. And uh, you can present this data differently where you can lay each of the quarters for these proteins. And bottom line is that the synapsin is always um, slower to enter the glutam species than uh, synaptophysin. I was telling her about how this, you inspired me to do these experiments. <laughs> <laughs>
question. So you call it solvable. So to me, solvable means that the diffusion coefficient of the protein exactly corresponds to the molecular size. Yeah, so that's so a bad that, word. So I don't know a good word. Right. Because this is because if you compare AG with P to to synapse, I don't know how I would put that to weight, but that's a problem more than five four times bigger or so, right? So you can easily calculate. No, it's just two, two times. Okay, two times bigger. So you can easily calculate because the diffusion rates for soluble proteins, that's the GFP, but for many others, have been determined by very many people pretty mm -hmm. precisely. So yes. if your protein does not diffuse with this rate in the neurons, it means that by the, to me it sounds like it's not soluble by definition. Right, so you don't know what to call it. Because I just cannot find uh, I mean, I can call them STD proteins. The problem is that these are these are traditionally just in my So these are traditionally known as uh, soluble proteins. I actually call them cytosolic protein in my paper. Because I want it exactly for that reason. I want people to make the distinction between a truly, truly soluble protein and a slow component B protein, which also is composed of these are known. These are known to be soluble, you know, like they, they just don't, they don't have a memory. But also, they also could be by some definition a soluble protein because it's not transmembrane. It's, it's a part of a large complex called the ribosome, mm -hmm. which has a very slow diffusion coefficient because it's large. Right. So in this case, I don't know what, in which complex uh, the synapse is uh, in So I'll talk about that a little bit. But clearly, this is not diffusion because it is micro diffusion. <coughs> It is motor dependent and it has a bias in that sense. So the, the way I think of it is that diffusion is a component of this movement because it just has to be these proteins just diffuse. I mean they are not tethered to membranes. And then on top of the diffusion we have a axonal transport of these of these proteins. How do you have to be able to tether to membrane? I mean they tether to something, otherwise they would diffuse. I'll show you right, um, otherwise they would diffuse. Yeah, so they do diffuse as well. But there is, you're right about the membrane, I'll come to that in the next time. No, this is a good point. Yeah, please. It's not a biophysical definition, it's a biochemistry definition. Yeah. 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 Yeah, because, you know, part of my problem is that these words like SCV and SCA are 30 years old, and when I use them, I'm thinking about it, I'm talking about it. So, maybe I'll stick to the side of the problem. Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll, um, synapsin is also known to bind to actin, depending on the phosphorylation state. Yes. Okay, so, how Okay, so actin is also known to be transported in silicon polarity. That's also very well established. But I think that's a that's a story that is unclear. But maybe we can talk about it later. So these are all really good points. But uh, again, we are just at, at the beginning. I don't know if you want to agree, but we are at the very beginning of understanding this neuron. And I don't know if I guess to get regularly on board. Okay. So um, let me just present the data maybe. The point is here, which are very good options. So anyway, so yeah, there is no maximum function. Mm -hmm. I hope I can do something like that. All right, so the obvious question is how does this phenomenon happen? Right? So when we looked at these, uh, so I had this data for three years that I didn't really believe in it because I was expecting this stop and go movement to happen and there was this, you know, I thought we were looking at diffusion and David, who was my student at the time, to come and look, there's a bias in the eye. This is something that we can imagine. And another thing we imagine when we look at this time of gas very closely, if you just peel your eyes and look at it, you can see that there, it seems that there's some kind of a streakish kind of a motion going on. This is just this little. I mean, you have to kind of look at it like a Chinese painting from 30,000 feet, but you can see that there's, looks like there's some kind of something sort of moving within this, and maybe there's some particles that are aggregating and on top of something or something like this, which is just our imagination based on looking at these diagrams over and over again. And this is pretty much the same every time. And the streaks are similar to fast axon pairs, but they're about one micrograms per second. Uh, we did particle tracking, but we were scared to put it in the paper. Uh, I guess we didn't really know what to think about it. But, but since then, we've done it for various proteins and we always see it. 
So one of the ideas that has been in the literature for a long time is that the soluble proteins make some sort of protein complexes. And then the protein complexes are carried in the axons by some motion. So that's just a hypothetical argument that has been made. And we I'll show you some evidence that I think these proteins are in such a complex in neurons. And the reason we know, we know that we think that is that if you take a brain enlargement and you do a classic synaptosomal cap, right, which is the P2 cap, but you throw out the synaptosome because you want to look at the non synaptosomal function of the protein. And then if you spin it down really hard, and this is from mouse brain to um, and you get a pellet, which is P100, and you get a soluble fraction, which is S100. Um, and if you look, uh, and if you lay these fractions in density gradients, and this is the lighter gradient, this is the heavier gradient, and you just draw the gradient for various vesicular and cytosolic proteins, if you do that, what you find is that the vesicular proteins, like some epithysin, like the PDF protein, they kind of float at the top, which is not surprising in the vesicular membrane. But interestingly, for all slow axon transport, all cytosolic proteins that we've looked at, we find significant fractions of this protein in really high density compartments. And there is some overlap with the vesicular compartments, which are harmful to the rest of them. If you treat these fractions with tritin, which will solubilize membranes, what happens is that what you would expect that the synaptophysin and the PP gap the vesicular proteins kind of now move to high density fractions because of the which dissolved the membranes. Uh, and but interestingly, there's little change in the high density fractions of the cytosolic proteins. Um, but there is some change in the lighter fractions of the cytosolic proteins that were, so were in the, in the fractions you know, 3 to 6, so you can see. And there's just, I think there's significance to this, which I'll come to. All right. So coming back to this, these uh, timograms, and we can see that this still in you know, so, you know we, we talk about modeling this phenomenon to see whether we can understand uh, this phenomenon a little bit better. And I almost never showed this, uh, we spent a long time doing this modeling, but I almost never showed it, but not really great. But in this audience, I'd like to show this modeling and how we did it. So, what we did was, uh, as Anna mentioned, a lot of the diffusion and coefficient that a lot of these proteins are removed. So the diffusion coefficient of GFP tax maximum is not somebody has to get that. So what we did was we assumed a cylindrical environment, which is the axon, and the diameter is about the same as our axon, which is one like that. And then we uh, we put in a lot of uh, uh, synapsin particles, all these green dots uh, are the synapsin particles that are clustered at the center. And then we allowed these dots to just move around by the minimum diffusion coefficient. So and then uh, in this uh, in this region, then we uh, shot some of these billiard balls that you can see here. We shot, uh, we kind of uh, made these balls come in and go through this region of a hypothetical synapsin particles and go across. And this is just to show you an example of how these balls are moving. But we gave these balls a, a what we call a cessation radius, which is we said that if these green particles enter within this halo of this ball, then they would stay attached to the ball for user-defining periods of time. Okay. By the way, this was done by somebody who's very smart than me. So another advice to you, if you see someone who's very smart than me, hire and I go. Um, so I just know the kind of how the, the what happened, not really so much how it happened. But anyway, this is the basic principle. So you can imagine these balls as they're going in, they are associating with these green dots. And uh, and the balls are moving in both directions, but I'll show you that in a little bit. But they can only associate with the, with the balls that are moving anteriorly. And just to give an idea of the, how the stimulation works, um, you have these balls and then you have some action. So we don't know what these balls are, we call them the mobile units. And I think I'll show you uh, towards the end what we think these mobile units might be. And this is again just an example to show you. We have way more you know, balls shooting through, you see. Um, but as, as, the, as the movie goes on, you can see that uh, you, you, get, uh, you get transferred. So this is a time of like from one such simulation. The green stuff is, is are the synapsin balls that we're seeing. Well, synapsin, 
and the red ones, red lines are anterior wave balls that were shot in this environment. The blue lines are the retro wave balls, and the yellow, the red see yellow, are the regions where the green particles or synapsin molecules associated with this anteriorly moving environment. And doing this, we can we can simulate the intensity center shift that we saw on our actual data. And of course, we just keep modulating the dissociation the dissociation radius to get that. So it's it's a little bit artificial, but it allows you to to understand the system a little bit uh, and ask what kind of association persistence, lifetime, etc. can happen. So based on this, we we were thinking of this model called uh, we call it dynamic recruitment model. Where essentially you have different cytosolic proteins that are um, tethered together by something, but then you would have this mobile unit which comes along into the axon, and then you would have a, uh, some of these cytosolic proteins with uh, complexes that associate with this mobile unit. The complexes would be carried for some time, but the complexes would have a dynamic association and dissociation among themselves, which um, by which they would just come, across, come apart at various periods of time, and that could explain the motion that we see. Yes. So, the obvious question is what is the mobile unit? Right. What is it that is actually propelling this motion? So, the simplest explanation that uh, the, the first thing that we thought about testing was that they were resistance. Because a lot of these cytostolic proteins are known to bind to resistance. Uh, how much time do we have? I have to keep So we asked whether these were resistance because I remember I showed you that in all of the radiolating experiments, when people have, um, have looked at them carefully, they found small amounts of slow component B proteins in the fast transport. So maybe the, the amount that's in the fast transport is representing the very front of, uh, of the movement where there's a persistent associated with the vesicles we thought. And then again, as, as we mentioned, the instantaneous uh, velocities of the mobile units that we measured by a single particle tracking, which I will show and I'm not showing it, um, is similar to that of uh, moving distance. So this was an easy hypothesis to test because uh, there are many known ways of disrupting this stuff, and we did three of them. So uh, the way we did the experiment is we transfected uh, neurons with. Uh, so okay. So before before I go into it, I want to just mention that there's the three ways of disrupting the circle. There's one by using the cutting name, which is now only plus the exit of uh, uh, going to the vesicles. Then this construct called the other one, which is a dominant negative construct, which also acts pretty much the same way the propelling A works, is that it blocks the other, which are the proteins that are involved in uh, essentially these going to the And then we use the temperature block, where we just reduce the temperature of the system to 19 degrees, which also causes a, a slowing of the exit of the vesicles. So the first thing I want to show, uh, well, I don't have time to show you, but uh, in each of these, we tested them first. Uh, to see whether the transport of syn synaptopycin um, was blocked, and indeed in all these cases the transport of synaptopycin was negative or not. Um, but there was no change in the transport of mitochondria, which is in computer stuff. They do not use the yellow body virus to have their own genome. Um, so, do you see the bias for the small people who get particles? So, how do you see the action? So when we when we do that, what we found is that in all these different cases, which is repelled in ARF1 rooted or 19 degrees Celsius, uh, the green line depicts the axonal transport of synapsin, the slow transport, which I showed you to the intensity on the shift over time. And in all these cases, we actually almost completely blocked or inhibited the movement based on how much innovation of fast transport we have. It's kind of interesting. So for all of you who have looked at fast transport, you know that there is some inherent fluctuations in fast transport, right? I mean, you look at one axon, you see 
And even if you look at the same axon over a long time, you can see some of these inherent fluctuations which are similar. And we also saw similar fluctuations with slower signals. So in this case, I'm showing you the raw data from uh, 15 or 20 axons that were just, that we looked at the uh, intensities and the shift of axon with. And you can see that though there's a mean shift, mean shift is in the actual direction, there's quite a bit of variability in the individual shifts. Right? And the same thing, again, you will see the class transport. And these are just five different uh, kind of class, and the, you're looking at the axon of transport of symmetric class in these kind of class. And you can see that even if you look at the same kind of graph from transport volume, there's, there's a lot of variability in the, in the frequency of movement. For example, here there's a burst of movement, and there's a gap for a little bit, and burst of movement, and gap. And this just highlights some of these variations. So I don't know why these variations happen. To the size of the variation of the axon. But we thought that we could actually smart these variations to test our hypothesis whether slow transport is indeed dependent on fast transport. And the experiment that we did was we transmitted neurons with a red snapping button and a PAG of this And then we imaged synaptopycin for 15 seconds with a quick imaging at 10 frames a second. And then immediately thereafter, like just rapid, rapidly switched to image synapsin transport, where we go back to it and we look at the transport, look at the intensity signature. And then after 45 seconds, in the same axon, we immediately switched and looked at synapsin person transport. So the idea was that you would basically get two sets of axons. One set where you would have a lot of transport in the before and after. And then other sets where you had less transport in the before and after. And the question you were asking was that would the synapsin transport depend on the magnitude of synaptopycin transport in the same axon? And here's two examples just to show you. So this is an axon. Uh, this is the before imaging of synaptopycin. This is the imaging of synapsin. You can see there's the shift. And this is the after imaging of synaptopycin. And in this axon, you have lesser movement and you have pretty much no shift here. And if you quantify all this data, the, and you lay on the y-axis, you lay the average intensity center shift of synapse, and on the x-axis, you just lay out the number of anterior synapse passing particles. We saw a pretty good correlation, and this is r squared, by the way. So a pretty good correlation of the anterior shift in synapse transport to the number of particles, synapse passing particles moving anteriorly, but not with uh, stationary or retrograde, retrograde or stationary particles. So again, these data also suggest that the the magnitude of slow axon transport in our axons is actually dependent on the magnitude of fast axon transport in the same axons. Um, another evidence we have that uh, vesicles may be involved in this phenomenon. As I showed you this picture before, and I told you that we photoactivated synapsin in the cell body, and we looked at this region to see the emergence of synapsin molecules into the axon. But in the same experiment, we also did a second thing where immediately after imaging synapsin emergence into this region of the axon, we went to a distal part and asked how, um, if you look at synapsin movement in this, what you really see. And what we saw in that time was very interesting. We actually saw a lot of little particles that moved very rapidly. It looks like residual transport. So this to us at that time suggested that, um, and, and, and combined with whatever else I've shown you, that you can imagine that these movements which you're seeing distally uh, might represent the very most persistent particles that happen to stay associated with synapsin for prolonged periods of time. And that's what you're seeing here. Yeah. So we just move out other parasympathies on the synapses to the Um actually a lot of proteins I know can find is not being associated with vesicles and uh, but not all. So like yeah, I don't know if it's yeah, the yeah, HMR these proteins are not going to be associated with vesicles. So one possibility is that you have um, these proteins forming complexes, but then the complexes contain some vesicle associated proteins and some not. And, and the vesicle associated proteins may 
be the ones that are sort of the drivers of these complexes. But we don't know that. That's kind of what we can figure out. But we are trying to define the complexes. So um, another evidence that vesicles have been involved is that if you look, if you transfer neurons with GLP synapses, and just look very distally and extremely thin axons where you don't have much of a solar, it's all over the corner. You do see these persistent uh, kind of movements, and if you do a, a double labeling experiment, the trend, and it's likely that these molecules are not only moving, but they're also held together in the axon in one place by maybe acting um, at a moment. But I think if you, if you really think about it, that actually is a very smart way to do these things, right? Because not only you have a way to move, propel them on the axon, but you also have a way to form them there. Right? And they are held there and they just wait for the recipes to come in, carry it by, and then they have another outpost just next to it, which is there to hold molecules as they detach. Right? So there's some mechanism that is preventing them from freely diffusing into the axon, which you would expect synapses should do if you removed uh, all kind of normal elements. It's a very good idea. Right, so it is, right? Because it just rapidly diffuses in both directions. So you uh, you want to use something that does is held but cannot be transported? Is that what you're thinking? I don't know, I think we have this first figure out the uh, domains of synapse and that. Is moved in there and stuff like that before we can do that experiment. So if you if you really know that the internal is involved, for instance, you could delete it and then ask. We haven't done that much. Yeah. 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 Okay, so we looked at uh, we looked at many, but right now we have published data for for I think four years, and then the, there's one caveat to this technique that we're using, which is that. As Anna pointed out, every single solid protein has a diffusible component, right? So in some protein, what happens is that if your diffusible component is faster than your transfer component, then this analysis cannot be done the way we are doing it with the simple intensity standards. Now there are some fancy ways you can separate diffusion and transport, but I would just have not gone in that direction. We just have chosen proteins that um, we can actually see the transport of. But you know, the four or five proteins is not bad. The list of the CV is not that big. So we are trying different things. Tau actually, Tau also means like this. Tau is also a solid system in all the more So I'm sorry, So that's a good question. Do all soluble proteins form complexes? We don't know, but we've only looked at it. Uh, but actually, so all of them that we have tested, which are four or five, um, are in, if you do a density gradient, they are they're found in, in higher density patterns. So that doesn't necessarily mean that they form complexes. We've actually isolated complexes of, for synapses, and this is definitely in a protein complex. And we have identified components. So I, I think that they, they all find complexes. But uh, I don't know what the argument is that they all find complexes. But are you contradicting by the last question? I'll show you that there is a certain solid in the that doesn't form complexes. I'm still moved by the Yeah, so that's what I'm going to do with the last solid. So the function has to be good. Right, yeah. So, Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so I mean, if you are interested, I would love to have someone who actually, you know, wants to do this. So I mean, a lot of uh, biophysicists in this in my area, they are very excited and they can continue to talk about this exactly separate ways of now. You know, we have all the data sitting there. So, and we have other solid equipment that I mentioned is very hard to uh, distinguish the uh, diffusible component from the transport component. Uh, and I would love to collaborate with someone who is here in a while. 
Um, but for me as a biologist, I look at this and I see you guys using fancy math to find it out. And I want someone to impress with that because I cannot evaluate. <laughs> So why do we see normal physiologic fluctuations in slower and faster? I think we see that because we have additionally there's a correlation with the normal vesicle fluctuations in the synapse. So I think the cytosolic fluctuations are happening because of the vesicle fluctuation and the vesicles are we can are carrying these cytosolic fluctuations. <coughs> So why do the vesicles actually I don't think anybody really knows it. I mean the thing is that it happens for sure, everybody is seen and is side transfers. Well that's what we were discussing. Maybe we can talk about that later. I, I, I think that at least for our system, I mean this is obviously a complex way of moving. They've actually isolated this complex with the uh, mass test studies. I'm sorry. I think we should answer that. I think we, we haven't really looked at different portions of the axons to see how, how slow axon pressure differs along the axon. So we always standardize our thing and we always look at 200 micron divisions and volume and stuff like that. That's interesting. Yeah, we haven't done that. Uh, in our system, it's a little bit harder to do that because these nouns are, are sort of many candidates, and also they're actually already known to the synaptic nouns. But we could go the other nouns and we do the same thing on them. But I think that's okay. So, and we discussed that also. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, how about the benefits of the new time since in the case of track and objectives? So, many things will be stuck in the axon. So, anyways, there will be a lot of hindrance for the normal transport of part of the group. Though they are small, but uh, if they are transported in form of complex, then all the equipment, all the volume of the axon is already in stock up. So, it cannot move either way in any part. So, maybe we will have to do a lot of the structure. Even then, uh, it is not. Mm -hmm. I want to add that the Yes, I'm trying to suggest something like the like the interpilator transfer is uh, I think it's a great example of a protein complex that moves. But in that case, I think the protein complex associates directly with the motors. Um, I, I, I mean, as I said, that it's very difficult for me to absolutely prove that the vesicle is the mobile motor. I mean, it's still possible that the complex is actually running through the motor and not the vesicle per se. And that, um, that that's how it is. So we don't really know, but obviously there's a person in the protein complex is moving, and there may be some. As you find our master regulators within this complex that just holds the whole complex together, which is then about the number that we haven't found as much to regulate. Binding polarity, are they actually actually binding? Differ based on how they associate with this uh, with this master regulator. That's a very exciting idea. Yeah, I mean, we have so much at the beginning of the series that I don't think we have uh, Okay. Just uh, like, about um, yeah, so a lot of people in the field are very interested in actin. So actin, people have shown that actin also moves in STD. So that's more. Um, and one of the ideas has been there for a long time that actin can be that master regulator that we've seen, but it's a very sticky problem. So you could have an actin meshwork that moves in the axon. And we have other proteins that binds to actin, which then moves along the axon. So we have done some experiments with uh, PAGFP actin and uh, GFP actin, and uh, I really haven't been able to see any kind of 
get in the movement of acting and acting. I think I see one picture that runs up with the So the situation of the act, instead you have an active pre-selling and you have the important conventional which presumably is the issue. And then you have some fairly short points, in my understanding, because they're in the marriage. Half a micron. Half a micron. Half a micron. Wow. So, so there's a little bit. These short films are actually comparable to the complexes that we're talking about. So maybe those short films are the transport form. Or alternatively, is it a freedom? Supposedly, the supplements that for transient complexes may be possible to tap into a very similar mechanism to what the problem is. Yeah, so so we, we did an experiment, and so exactly to resolve this issue, so Peter is saying that they could be shot at in the moon, so they could be like little dots that would be in essence. And he's not, what he's saying is that it would be really hard to see because Atkin has this donor like uh, satisfactory network under the plasma membrane as well, so you can let them all activate and find so much Atkin that you would not be able to resolve this in a single small uh, Atkin binder, right? So I thought that the way they started to resolve this, which is using uh, their limits, eutrophin constraints. So the so eutrophin is an article that is known to only bind to active ones and not to active ones. You have to have four subunits of active for you to be in uh, The problem was that when I did the experiments with these knots, it, it really enhanced the assembly of active. So you could see this really wonderful phenomenon where you have this remarkable um, assembly of the dendritic spines and, and things like that. It just um, really prevented acting from moving anything because these neurons just die out a little bit because there was just so much polymeric acting in it. And when I talked a bit about it, it seems that it only in neurons this is a problem where you have, where this construct doesn't work. But it works for pretty much everything else. There's a different acting, the light act acting. Which uh, I just didn't uh, have the chance to use it yet uh, because I wasted so much time with uh, the But I think at some point we will uh, return to the acting problem because I think it's uh, fascinating. Maybe you have to be doing this now. Gap of acting. So the problem with acting in our axon is that there's actually not that much acting in it. So if you look at the acting distribution, it's kind of the sequence, and there's a little bit here and a little bit there. Uh, we haven't done a track. No, no, it will. The cortical one will also recover because that actually will recover probably faster than the thing because it has solid work and done. Uh, I